Americans watching it. I know it is weird to not be excited about a Friday. How you holding up, everybody? I'm Dan Haggerty. This is the story. I do want to say we have a lot of new people watching us this week. Maybe tonight's the first time you're catching us. Hopefully you find us to be everything that we're trying to be, which is a little different, more authentic. Uh, for those of you who have been with us since the beginning, my peeps, bear with me for just one minute as I teach the new people our secret handshake. Now, this is a place where we try to make you part of the story. So email us or find me on Facebook. Talk to us on Instagram or Twitter using the hashtag HeyDan. Something else that you'll probably notice is that we're not really into that overdramatic, very serious newsman thing. That's not really my deal. Uh, but we are very serious about answering your questions, as many as we can, and uh, with good, accurate information with context. That's important to us because right now, I think we need that more than ever. And in that spirit, I want to start with something that Governor Brown said today she is not doing. She is not yet ordering Oregonians to shelter in place, even though the governor of Illinois did that today, even though the governor of New York did that today, even though the Bay Area has been doing that for a little bit now, and even though Mayor Wheeler has said he's considering order, ordering Portlanders to shelter in place. So for now, Governor Brown isn't really ordering you to do anything, just saying, pretty please don't leave your house. I am encouraging, I am urging all Oregonians to stay home. Um, and we have been saying that for a number of weeks, and it particularly applies a number of weeks, days. Uh, it, it particularly applies to our most vulnerable Oregonians, our elders and those with underlying medical conditions. As I said earlier, uh, if there's evidence that Oregonians are not complying with the aggressive social distancing measures, um, I will certainly need to impose more restrict restrictive measures. Governor Brown this morning also had some news the doctors and nurses have been desperate to hear that they have ordered more medical equipment and a lot of it. She said the state put in an order to FEMA for 1 million N95 surgical masks, 300,000 test swabs and 140 ventilators. But she still isn't quite sure when we're going to get more tests. We just know to expect 20,000 of them someday. Apparently there's some kind of supply chain issue, which isn't surprising since every state in the country wants more tests right now. As for unemployment, employment, which I know a lot of you are worried about. The governor had some mixed news there. Now, on one hand, she said our unemployment fund is actually the second highest in America. We've got five billion dollars saved right now. As for the bad news, and this should probably give you some perspective as to how many people are losing their jobs right now, it's probably still not going to be enough. I have been very, very clear that we will not have enough resources in the state of Oregon to meet all of the need uh, that is in our communities across the state. She did say they are taking steps to make it easier and faster for you to sign up for unemployment. And Oregonians should still expect to get their kicker rebate and their taxes. And today, the Treasury Department announced that you don't need to file your taxes until July 15th of this year. Now, if you've been watching us here in the story, you know that we've been taking plenty of shots at the state's sloppy rollout of Real ID. Remember, starting in July, we were all supposed to go to the DMV to get those new ID cards before October 1st. Well, the governor has now requested that that October 1st deadline be extended one year. Not sure if that request is going to be granted, but the state is trying to keep us all from packing into the DMV during a pandemic. Now, I know that you're all at home cooped up inside right now. You want nothing more than to get out and enjoy the freedoms of your normal life without fear. But I will tell you, I've talked to a lot of people who would do anything to be in your shoes right now, which are planted right here in Oregon. Thousands of Americans are stuck abroad as we speak, unable to find flights, unable to get help. Sandy Cahill from Lake Oswego talked to me from Morocco this week after her husband reached out to us here at the story to tell me what was going on. She was on a 10 day trip. She was with a group of friends. They were in Morocco and it went into total lockdown. Her travel pictures, you see them, they went from sightseeing and fun to an abandoned resort being monitored by medical workers in masks. Uh, well, the guy that got in touch with you, Steve Cahill, is a big fan of your show. My husband, he's a former journalist. Um, he knows how the business works. Um, he's waiting for me. And then all of our ladies have friends and family. Um, it's very emotional. She mentioned there that her husband knows how the journalism business works. Well, for those of you who don't exactly, I'll tell you this. By the time people come to us, they have usually exhausted their other options. 
Delta canceled her flights and have no plans to get them out of the country. She called lawmakers but didn't get any real help from them either. Yesterday, Oregon Senator Jeff Merkley and several other senators sent a letter to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo urging the U.S. to help people like Sandy to get home. Merkley wrote, this crisis calls for creative measures, including working with foreign governments, commercial airlines, U.S. military and other agencies to ensure that every American can be safely returned home. Now, even as I do this story, I wonder how many of you are at home watching and know someone who's in a situation like this. I didn't have to look far. I talked to Matt Safino, who told me about one of his best friends, Terry Woodburn. Terry sent Matt a bunch of videos from the airport in Santiago, Chile, and described a bit of what it's like for everyone there. Level of stress here and everywhere has greatly magnified uh, for people's desperation to get home. Uh, especially in the case of the Europeans, who seem to be having an extraordinarily difficult time getting back to the EU countries. And there's a little reminder to you that every country is dealing with something like this. So the option to maybe fly to London or to Paris and then make your way home is really not an option. And I keep seeing these stories, all right? The Oregonian, they interviewed two students from Lewis and Clark who are stuck in Ecuador. Last night, we talked to a father and son from Portland who were stranded in Peru. You see him here. Our director who helped develop this very show, Jay Sotomayor, narrowly made it back from the Netherlands last night. These pictures uh, pretty much sum him up. He's currently holed up in his Portland apartment on a two-week mandatory quarantine. Now, Jay's story should give you a little bit of hope that your loved ones can still get home right now. But I want to remind you, the very same day that Senator Merkley and those other senators sent that letter to the Secretary of State, the U.S. State Department issued a statement. It said, have travel plans that do not rely on the U.S. government for assistance. Okay, that last story ended with a, a bit of a bummer, but hopefully this next one lifts you up. Now we continue to see the strength of our schools and the communities that support them and we're lucky enough to share that with you in a very unique way through our series Inside Woodlawn. If you don't know, Kristen Severance is spending an entire year with unprecedented access inside the Woodlawn Elementary School. We've been with them through a lot of uh, the struggles of gentrification, deportation, and now coronavirus. I want to tell you that we shot this story a day before KGW decided to move all of our interviews to FaceTime or video conference. Here's Kristen Severance. The coronavirus has stopped everything. Yes, to say the least. But nothing can stop Woodlawn from helping families. We are thinking of our kids all the time and thinking of our families. Today we have a mobile pantry going on. Um, we're going to be serving food from 12 to 1.30 where people are either able to walk up and grab a bag of food or they're able to drive up and get a bag of food. I sent down a text to all of our families. Normally, Woodlawn would have a food pantry inside the cafeteria, but now it's outside. We have the pantry every week throughout the entire year. And even though there's a pandemic going on and there's a lot of people in crisis, it's not going to change us still having food available for families who need it. Some meat, some pasta. Instead of shopping for food, families can pick up pre-made bags. We're pre-packaging bags due to the coronavirus. They're taking precautions. We got some gloves. We have disinfecting wipes. We're prepared to make sure everyone is safe. Hey, would you like apples and uh, carrots? Yeah. You're welcome. It's an all hands on deck. Kind of Principal situation. Andrea Porter Lopez says she would never leave families without a way to feed kids. Do you guys want to take some food? Yeah. Timing is important. I think families are taking care of um, extended family. The kids are all at home. I think grown ups are not at work and they're home taking care of kids and it's been hard to find things at the store. It's it's just difficult to make it through week to week anyway, never mind when the adults in the house can't go to work because either they're taking care of their kids or their work has closed and they've been laid off or left. It means a lot when you let when you're not working so that you can be able to feed your families without being stressful. You know, and having them out here uh, taking their time to make sure that uh 
getting something to eat and appreciate it, you know? All right, you guys stay well, healthy, All right. okay? All right, thank, thank you. you. You know, this affects everybody in the community, and so it's just well, really a blessing for us and our families. Are you able to get one for a friend? I have a family uh, that's not with my dad, and it's over at my other house. <laughs> Awesome. You're welcome to some apple. Because while the building may be closed, Thank you for all your service. Absolutely. Woodlawn is not a place. More people eating. It's a community. Yep. Grab a bag. Always looking out for each other. We have provided more food today in 40 minutes than um, we will to single individuals on a regular Wednesday night. Thank you for this. Which is great. It's people getting food. This is great. I love it. Thank right. you. Thank you, guys. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Okay, Kristen joining us now. I, I can speak probably for a lot of our viewers at home. I feel like we know these kids at Woodlawn at this point. Yes, people we work with, viewers, people are invested you know, in this story, in these people. And coronavirus has stopped a lot of things, but it is not stopping inside Woodlawn. You know, we're part of this project. What we wanted to do was show how schools overcome challenges, huh. overcome obstacles. And I don't think they've ever dealt with something like coronavirus, but I know they will always be there for kids and we'll be there to tell their stories, maybe remotely, maybe FaceTime, but we'll keep doing this. If you're looking for some stuff to do uh, throughout this weekend as you're kind of holed up in your apartment, check out Kristen's series Inside Woodlawn. If you don't know these kids like I do at this point, trust me, it's worth your time. So hop on there on a KGW YouTube channel and give it a watch. Kristen, thank you. You bet. When the story continues, you've been asking some great questions using the hashtag HeyDan. We've been getting a ton of them, and we're going to answer some of them next. And we know there's some other news out there happening that's not related to the coronavirus, so we're going to share some of that with you, too. And are we headed toward a quarantine baby boom? I'm just saying. Hey, everybody. So some real talk right now from my home office, which is just my home now. I know many of you have been doing your part to participate in social distancing. That means staying home if you can, working from home if you can, and I know for a lot of you that's just not an option. But here's why it's so important to me. I'm thinking a lot about my parents and especially my dad right now. Um, I haven't talked a lot about this publicly, but my dad is battling stage four prostate cancer, and it's been really difficult. Anybody who has had a family member with cancer knows exactly what I'm talking about, but this COVID-19 outbreak has really just added a lot of anxiety and a lot of concern and worry for our family right now. So I beg and I plead with every one of you, when you're going out, when you're visiting friends and family, the reason we need to practice social distancing is not maybe for people like us who are younger and feeling healthy and feel fine, it's for the people in our lives like my dad who don't have a choice but to be immunocompromised and to be at a higher risk for serious illness. Please practice social distancing for the people that you love in your life and for the people that you don't even know. Welcome back to the story. Keep those questions coming using the hashtag HeyDan. We'll answer some of them in just a bit. First, I wanted to talk, though, about the census. So the deadline for the count has been pushed back two weeks. But yes, it is still happening despite all this craziness we're living through right now. Good thing is you don't even have to leave your home to fill it out, which is great because you're literally not supposed to leave your home right now. Here's Morgan Romero. On Wednesday, the Census Bureau said it's suspending field operations for two weeks until April 1st to protect the health and safety of Americans, their employees, and people going through the hiring process. Amid the coronavirus outbreak, the Bureau is encouraging everyone to fill out the questionnaire early so a census taker doesn't have to come to your door in May. They only visit you if you haven't responded online, over the phone, or by mail. Charles Reinerson is the interim director of Portland State's Population Research Center. He's concerned if the census isn't reliable, they could reach inaccurate conclusions about changes from 2010 to 2020. Probably the biggest concern is, is counting other types of non-household situations. For example, students who, were, who live in dorms, you know, they should be counted at the college where they live, but colleges are closed now, so they may not be there. That's a huge concern because the Census Bureau had set up systems to, to count people in what's known as group quarters. So, and that includes nursing homes 
as we know now is a big challenge due to COVID-19. Truly and honestly, do you feel like the Census Bureau is prepared for this massive obstacle? Truly and honestly, they are doing what they can. They have a task force trying to evaluate whether they need to redo some of their operations. The Census Bureau is adjusting and working with administrators at colleges, nursing homes, prisons, and group homes to get rid of in-person contact and move to online or mail response. Plans to count people experiencing homelessness change too. The Bureau is now asking shelters and meal providers to count everyone they serve between March 30th and April 1st and provide a paper response. More on that on our website, kgw.com. Hey everybody, I'm Matt Safino. Welcome back. And you know what? I want to bring you a, a really interesting perspective. It's from the International Space Station. A lot of the astronauts up there have been chiming in uh, with their perspective on the coronavirus. And think about it. These are people that are trained on working alone or in limited numbers in confined spaces under incredibly stressful conditions. So they're kind of experts on dealing with stuff with this. This is European Space Agency astronaut Alexander Gerst looking out of the cupola on the space station with their unique view of planet Earth. But I want to bring you this quote. This is from a Canadian space agency astronaut named Chris Hadfield. And I'm going to circle the part at the end because that's the important part. He says the best antidote antidote for fear is competence knowing what to do. And I think he sums it up really, really well. That's what we need from the very top of our government, down to the state level, down to the local level, and down to the personal level. It's never been more important for all of us to do the right thing right now. It's important for you. It's important for your family, your neighborhood, your city, your country, and really for the world as everybody and everywhere is being taxed uh, for resources to combat the coronavirus. So again, a really great view and perspective from the astronauts on the International Space Station. We've got some more tweets for you from the ISS and the astronauts. Here's one from Christina Koch saying, hey, a year ago launching into space reinforced me uh, that the most important thing on Earth is people you love. So today, just keep that in mind from Jessica Meir. From up here, it's easy to see that we are all truly in this together, and that is absolutely true. Thank you, Jessica, for that. It's just so great to hear from these astronauts. Scott Kelly, one thing he learned in his 20 years at NASA, that the most problems aren't rocket science, but when they are rocket science, you should ask a rocket scientist. Love that. Never been more true, right? So, again, uh, just, to, just to reiterate their perspective, and these are people, again, who are very accustomed to working under incredibly high stress, confined spaces and, and really on their own often. Dan? Sometimes you got to step back to get some perspective and in this case step really far back. Matt, thank you. Sure. So we know everywhere you turn the news is all about coronavirus, but there are still some other stories that you need to know about out there and we don't want to ignore them. So here's a segment that we're calling In Other News. In Other News. A woman who stole more than $10,000 in donations from the Portland Women's March will spend about two years in prison. The Oregonian says Rebecca Brewis was one of the organizers of that march in 2017 to protest President Trump's inauguration. She pleaded guilty to collecting donations for the march and then putting them into her own online account. Washington Governor Jay Inslee just signed a bill that lowers the penalty for intentionally exposing a sexual partner to HIV. It used to be a felony, carrying a possible life in prison sentence. Now, it's a misdemeanor, with a 90-day jail sentence and fine. Supporters say the harsher sentence doesn't have an effect on reducing HIV transmissions, but others argue that an HIV infection has a huge impact on a person's life, and the punishment should fit that. Oregon women's basketball star Sabrina Unescu was just named to the AP's All-American First Team for the third time. She joins just seven other women in history who have been named to the team three times. On the men's side, the Ducks' Peyton Pritchard was also named to the All-American First Team. He is the first Oregon men's player in program history to get that honor. And that's In Other News. It's Friday night. It's been a long week. Everybody's been working from home. I'm just saying, if we see a baby boom in nine months, I won't be that surprised when the story continues. So this viewer asks, hey Dan, can heat kill the coronavirus on a surface? Heat from the oven, 
clothes dry or sunshine. All right, so hot weather or sunshine cannot kill the coronavirus. And according to the World Health Organization, hot baths, hot hand dryers, and ultraviolet lamps won't work either. I do have some good news. The best way to protect yourself to kill the coronavirus is soap, washing your hands. Keep sending in your questions using everyone's favorite hashtag, hey Okay, our next question is from Carolyn. She says, we are in our 70s and our house was just put on the real estate market. Is it safe to allow potential buyers to do a no touch walkthrough if they wash their hands, wear shoe covers, are healthy and are adults, or should we suspend all showings? So our expert said that she would recommend that they suspend showings for the time being, and here's why. Shoe covers sound great. Having a no touch rule, also great, but remember, you can get the virus from anyone, including healthy people, because they're asymptomatic. She said, suspend the showings for the time being. You can also set up a virtual showing in the future. Keep sending in those questions, please. We read all of them. We're doing our best to answer them using the hashtag HeyDan. All right, thank you to Kristen. People have been using that hashtag to send in your comments as well. I want to start with one from Jill. She said, hey, Dan, I keep hearing on television while you're stuck at home. Yuck. How about while you are at home safe? You know what? I agree with you. That's pretty smart. It's all about how you use your words and perspective matters. I agree with her. Tracy writing in and saying, hey, Dan, a special shout out to truck drivers. How about that? Tracy, I think you're right. Truck drivers have been working day and night delivering all the things that we keep buying from the grocery store to keep us comfortable while we're sheltering in place. Thank you to all the truck drivers out there for working hard for us. And Kat writing in, I love your new format. Why are people hating on it? People, people are hating on it? Look, we've been asking you to send in some pictures to us and you've been answering that call, showing us what it's like for you to work at home, your new work-life balance, all these different work setups you have there. I'm jealous of a couple of them. They look pretty good using the hashtag Hey Dan. Keep them coming. We keep looking through all the photos and we're going to keep putting them on TV. Maybe some people at home will get inspiration. Look at that one. You got like 10 monitors. I like it. I also am willing to bet with all these people staying home that in nine months we might see a little surge in babies being born. Don't believe me? During the 2013 government shutdown, hospitals in Washington, D.C. saw an additional three more babies born than average nine months later, according to news reports. After Hurricane Sandy, two hospitals in New Jersey delivered 20% and 34% increases in deliveries. I mean, baby boomers are literally named after the boom in babies born after World War II. So what am I getting at? Oh, nothing. Just stay at home. Enjoy yourself this weekend. That's all. It's the end of the story. Good night and stay safe.